Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cosy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high tippy red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they them pronouns, and I am a mafia crime boss who loves cookies. I'm Soren, I use he him pronouns, and I am a thimblet. We've been friends for over a decade and are always swapping books. Each fortnight we take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. On our shelf this month is Cozy Fantasy. So today let's get to talking about... Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. So, once again, our format's a little bit messed up because neither of us actually recommended this book to the other. What are we doing? We've got to change our entire identity. Uh, I think it's fine. Yeah, as long as we don't do it too often. We're just, we're keeping people on their toes. But this was an anticipated read, but not really an anticipated read because we obviously didn't know about it before it came out. Although I don't know if you knew about it when Sean and Maguire talked about it. I feel like you might have known about it for longer than me. I know there was a lot of talk about it on TikTok when it came out in America and a lot of hype. And then I got an arc of it. And yet, (laughs) I still haven't read it until now. (laughs) <laughs> when did you find out about it? I also just heard about it on the internet, vaguely. I don't remember the first time that I heard someone talk about it, but I think it's been on my Goodread for a while, definitely since before it was published here. You hear sapphic coffee shop at you and you're like, mm-hmm, yes. Exactly. Especially with uh, Dungeons & Dragons vibes. Exactly. Did I buy it for like three of our friends for Christmas? Because I was like, <laughs> D&D, sapphics. Had I read it yet? No. But we vibe. Exactly. So what's this book about? Legends and Lattes is about an orc barbarian who gets very sick of the adventuring lifestyle, all the violence, and she's like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to take me this little luck stone and I'm going to build a coffee shop in a city where nobody's heard of coffee. This will be fine. And then it is. And also she gets a love interest and a cool guy who sits in the kitchen being feral. And I love him. Among other cast of funky characters... And also the mafia are there. I wasn't expecting that at all. (laughs) I liked it. I liked it. Speaking of what we were expecting, should we listen to our blind summary? Yeah, let's go back to when we hadn't read it. So Morgan, we're reading Legends and Lattes. What do you know about it? Neither of us have read this one yet. Yeah. Okay, so I know it's sapphic. I know it's cosy fantasy. I know it's about an orc barbarian who used to be a warrior and then she's like, actually, screw it. I'm going to hang up my socks and I'm going to open the first coffee house in this place that I live now. And then I believe the love interest is a non-copyrighted tiefling. Ah, is it like a half demon or something? Yeah, I believe. That's all I know (laughs) as well. I don't have any new information at all, except (laughs) that I think that the author does play D&D and has mentioned it. Do we have any wild predictions? What's going to happen in Legends of Nartes? Um, I'm expecting a swooning falling off a ladder scene. Oh. I'm, yeah, random prediction okay, there. yeah, yeah. I'm expecting everybody to hate coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe the love interest will be the one to be like, what if we put some sugar in it or something? And maybe the protagonist will be a coffee purist and be like, no. But then that's what saves the coffee house. Oh my god. The adding of condiments i don't drink coffee is that obvious <laughs> what i'm saying right now <laughs> i also think there should be some armed bandits breaking into the coffee house at some point Ooh, mm. interesting yeah. yeah i feel like there's going to be a save the business type thing because i feel mm. like that's common for these sort of like stories where suddenly it's about to go under and then maybe they have like a community event or something and then the characters mm. that you've met along the way step in to help somehow oh so there's my other random theory. I love that. Okay, I think we have some, that's that's some good that's some good baseless theorizing, <laughs> <laughs> which is Are what this show is all about. Exactly. Amazing. So some hits, some misses. Some hits, some misses. I think that was okay. That was like fifty fifty, probably. Yeah. I'm a little sad that we don't have a swooning off the ladder scene now. Yeah, come on, it's right there. She literally lives in the loft. She falls off the ladder the first time she tries to use it. That's true, but nobody's there to catch her tragic. I feel like it would be Viv doing the catching, probably just by virtue of her being built. Mm, Maybe so. But you know, maybe Viv deserves to be swept off her feet as well. Exactly. We kind of got the community coming together. That's very Hallmark movie. So I actually read the Q&A at the back, and I can't lie, I read that before I read the book. And that helped me enjoy it slightly more. I'm gonna just come out and say I did not enjoy this book. (laughs) Really? Yeah. 
Um, I'm really sad, but I didn't. I was expecting to enjoy it more than I did. It was fine. It was kind of like watching a Hallmark movie. It was unobjectionable. I wouldn't do it again. Okay, I have three main gripes with this book. Number one, it should not have been marketed as a sapphic romance because it's not a sapphic romance. It's a book that has sapphics in it. And there's also a tiny romance at the end. At the end. Number two, I want more fantasy in my high fantasy books. There is basically no magic in this book. There's the luck stone, but all of the stuff that you'd go, ah, yes, we can do magic with that. They just go, it was invented by gnomes. Number three, people in Thune do not know what coffee is, but your readers know what coffee is. They know what air conditioning is. They know what croissants are. They know what chocolate is. You do not need to mansplain these things to me because I already know what they are, especially when I'm a barista and have been for five years. I was definitely wondering while I was reading it, how would Morgan feel about, for example, this machine working? Because you were probably thinking, well, obviously this is how a coffee machine works, right? Everybody, I was like, I can't even follow this. I don't know what's happening. Notoriously, I'm horrible at three-dimensional reasoning. I want to, I love steampunk stuff. The aesthetics are fantastic. I feel like I could understand the ceiling fan. The coffee machine was beyond me, but I feel like that at least went over my head personally. And I'm assuming it was just annoying for you then. I mean, the coffee machine was okay. Okay. It was like when Viv is making a latte and goes, oh yes, lattes, famously named after the person who invented them, latte diameter. That's kind of funny though. No, it's the Italian word for milk. But Italy doesn't exist, Morgan. And if I have to hear somebody say bean water one more time. One thing that we mentioned in our prediction was that everyone would hate coffee. And I was very surprised by the fact that almost nobody hated coffee. No one likes coffee on their first sip. Black coffee especially does not taste that good. I'm biased because I just don't like coffee at all. I used to be a double espresso drinker. I used to drink that. It doesn't taste good. I wasn't drinking it because I liked it. There was no sugar. We didn't have any conversations about sugar. And that could have been so good. Also, I was kind of like, use your advertising strategy is like, this will keep you awake. Surely there's people who have to work through the night. You're near a university. When they said that they were near the university, I was like, all right, this is their audience now. They're all writing their papers on multi-dimensional planar travel at three in the morning. Those are the ones that need coffee. But it was only Hamilton who came in from the university. And also... Country stalker, I guess. But there was no mention of caffeine. It was the cop out of using the gnomes. Like anytime you need modern technology, it was just, oh, the gnomes invented it. I'm reading The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett at the moment. And anytime he needs technology, he's just like, there's a little gnome guy who lives inside the camera and he paints really, really fast pictures. And I'm like, that is how you do magic system. Like, there's no world building. Maybe I'm just biased. No, I did find it really hard to get a foothold in Thune. It just felt very generic fantasy town. And I was sitting there being like, what's the vibe though? What are the exports? Speaking as a D&D player. But if my DM plonked me in a town and went, it's a port town, it's got taverns, I would be like, okay, that's fine because you're doing doing your best here but like is there anything special about this place at all like is there any way i can differentiate it from the next place and even i don't know if you read the short story at the end i read half of it i've appreciated the world building in that slightly more because it was the gnomish town and there was a bit more of an emphasis on the architecture and viv being able to see into the second story windows and stuff that felt more of a standout location to me and that was only in a couple of pages i assume that was written afterwards maybe that has something to do with it but i don't have any affection for thune which i was kind of expecting to by the end of this rant over because all of my co-workers also also read this book in the past two weeks because we just all sort of ended up reading it. So I've literally had this conversation with like five separate people. What's the barista vote? Basically, the consensus is that it was cozy fantasy, but very much just the vibe was meh. Like, I think it got threes across the board. In terms of writing style, it was serviceable but it wasn't memorable. This very much feels like a debut by somebody who hasn't written before. Not to be mean, but there was no writing flourish. It was just this happens and then this happens. It felt like a DM just describing what happens to players. It didn't feel like I was being told a story. The amount of cuts in each chapter where it was just like, and then we cut to this. I know it was supposed to be a Hallmark movie. It would work better as a Hallmark movie. Oh my gosh, actually as a film, this would be really cute. I think I would be super invested in this as a film. I do not think its medium should have been a book. A podcast, maybe? Graphic novel. I was also thinking podcast as well. The author is an audiobook narrator. 
Mm, that makes sense. And actually, speaking of, I thought his dialogue was pretty good, generally, but then I feel like he didn't use that, which was really annoying. The first, in inverted commas, date that Viv and Tandri go on, he just tells us what they talk about, and I was like, they're going to dinner together, alone, for the first time, and I, I want to be invested in them. Again, this isn't D&D. You don't have to cut away from the date to keep the rest of the table engaged and occupied. I understand dropping the curtain so that two characters can have a private moment at the table. This is a book. I want to know what they talk about. I want to know what they order. I want to know what the ambience of the place is like. Like, this is the first time that they've spent one-on-one -on -one time together just for fun like this. Let me see what they talk about rather than just tell me what they talk about because just telling me what they talk about isn't that interesting. Show, don't tell. Exactly. What do we think about the cover? The cover's great. I really like the cover, to be honest. Mm. I was a little bit on the fence about it compared with the original cover. We see, I think I have the best of both worlds with this edition because the end papers are the original cover. So you get the art. Yeah, whereas I've just got the new cover and nothing else. And the art is extremely cute. And I have to say, I did not notice that Thimble is in the art until I was about halfway through the book. He's a little in the corner and I do love him. So I was very happy when I realised that he was there with his little croissants. I was more compelled by the cover once I started reading the book. It suited the book so well. This is the sign. It's even got black blood through the centre. It looks like it's been scribbled onto a chalkboard. It's got that nice texturing. So I do really like it now. And I like the spine. It's nice wood orange colour. I was definitely most compelled by character interactions. Yeah. Those really got me through the book. The romance just felt a little bit flat. It almost felt building blocks towards the end. Like oh, we need to speed this up because we haven't started really romantically developing them beyond a little bit of an initial spark. So let's make them sleep in the same bed. Let's make her nurse her back to health. And these are all tropes that I enjoy. I'm not trying to bash them, but they felt very perfunctory. Just throw in some random tropes that you like. This will fix everything. Yeah. I think also, is it a male author trying to write sapphics and then either just getting it wrong or trying to lean away from the sexualizing sapphics stereotype? by over friendifying them and desexualizing them. I don't know, but it felt very like when kids get married on the playground when they're five years old. You know what it kind of felt like as well to me? It's a bit like when you're reading a book and there's a male character and a female character who get along and then they get together at the end and you're kind of like, yeah, sure, they're good friends, but why are they getting together now at this point? It's only just because there are a man and a woman standing next to each other. Weirdly, it felt like it had that syndrome to me. They kissed because it was time for them to kiss kind of thing. I think the other way that the author shot himself in the foot a little bit was making Tandri a succubus because immediately you go into yikes territory for consent Yeah, on both sides. So you have to over sanitize and then you end up over course correcting because you so don't want to lean into consent territory. Whereas if she'd just been a knockoff tiefling with some demon heritage that she felt bad about, you would have gotten the same thing across. And I do think it could have worked with her being a succubus. I actually think that could be really, really interesting. But I just don't think there was really time given to it here. Like, I don't remember if her stalker got resolved. I've finished this book today, by the way, and I'm still... <laughs> I can't remember what happened with him. He kind of just went away, didn't he? He was there to collect the tithe for the Madrigal, which I really want to get to, by the way, but we'll get there. I think he was just scared of the Madrigal. Viv's reaction to that didn't really seem logical to me. She's a massive orc lady. She can ban him from the premises if she wants and say, just send someone else to get these. They have Hemington drawing wards. Can they not arrange to keep this guy out? You know, I don't love the whole oh, I'm protecting you from an abusive ex or a stalker or something as a romantic overture, because that also leads into a weird territory of that's the bare minimum. You should be doing that for someone you consider a friend, if it's or even not a friend, just anyone. If it's in your power, if someone comes up to you and says, I need help for this reason, that's what you should be doing. So it doesn't you know, then make you entitled. So it's a bit weird to have that as the foundation for a romance. But if there is a foundation for the romance, it feels like Viv should be doing the bare minimum. I kind of feel like she wasn't there. If a friend came up to me and said, hey, this guy keeps turning up to my work, I would be taking that way more seriously <laughs> than they were. They were kind of just like, oh, this is just a side effect of her being a succubus. Hmm. And I don't know if that's a cis male writer syndrome a little bit. I don't want to make an mm. assumption there, but it just feels... Yeah. Yeah. Like, people would be way more like, okay, let's get this guy out. And that undermined a little bit the sort of found family vibes that were going, because it was like... I need to see you looking after each other. I appreciate what was strived for there, but because there was no follow through on elements like that. Yeah, I needed more of everyone supporting Viv in her business venture. I need more of other people's life issues. Like Thimble's just in the kitchen, seems to live only for the kitchen, somehow is churning out these things, never experiences burnout, never complains. 
Thimble was probably my favourite. Thimble and the Madrigal, two favourite characters, hands down. I have to say, the Madrigal, I appreciate the setup of the Mafia is going to be a problem, and then they're kind of not a problem. And okay, fine, maybe Viv isn't a hero, she was just a mercenary. Seems like she definitely took some jobs that she regrets taking. But when she's now trying to be a new person and establish herself as a figure of the community, and this is a very community-focused book, and it's about looking after your neighbours, etc., she seems very unconcerned that there's this extortion going on. Right. The police sit in on it and she's just sort of fine with it because she can get away with just giving cinnamon rolls. And I don't know, your neighbours are being extorted, Viv. You're just okay with that? Everyone else is having to pay the tithe. So why are you an exception? And if you are an exception, don't you think everyone else should be an exception and you should help everyone else? It's such a good conflict because she wants to leave behind violence. But this happens. And I appreciate that, like, okay, this is supposed to be a low-stakes story, but then don't introduce the Mafia in the first place. The Mafia are too high stakes then, if you want to keep this thing low stakes. But I think it works as a potential conflict, because she's like, I don't want to be that person anymore. But then she has these people who she cares about, and what's the right thing to do, and how do you reconcile the pacifist ideology with people around me are using violence to extort the pacifists around me, and I have the power to stop that? It just seemed Mm. kind of dropped as a thread. I mean, just resolved with while she likes the cinnamon rolls, which (laughs) felt like a cop out, basically. This would have been the perfect time for my favourite trope, which is the pacifist character is defended by a character who will just murder to help them out. Like, Tandri could have done it. If Tandri wants to show true love, Tandri can go on a murder spree. It's her turn. She gets to go violent. That's my favourite trope. It would have been perfect. It's not the vibe of a low-stakes fantasy, like, crazy fantasy, but um, it would have been good for me. Yeah, I mean, it's not the vibe, but then the vibe precludes corrupt authority figures. I appreciate that there's not a lot of conflict at the beginning without that, but I feel like some other element could possibly be introduced, even if it was just a rival tea shop who were trying to poach their business or something. I think it should have been something more that speed. The mafia are the mafia. People are going to die, lads. Right. Tandri's not being taken seriously because she can't go to the police because her stalker works with the mafia. That's really, really stressful. As a person who is mostly friends with women, it's reminding me of specific situations situations that those people have had to go through and it's hard to feel cozy (laughs) when that's going on the police are corrupt that's real life that's not cozy that's not fun at all and maybe i've just watched too much daredevil but it can't really be cozy i know if the mafia is involved in any way shape or form i really wanted more from fennis as a villain as well because what were his motivations apart from just to get the thing like why does he want it so bad because he's an entitled (laughs) yes that's fair but you know, what does he feel entitled to? Because I'm pretty sure Fennus thinks that Viv using this stone to start a little coffee shop is a waste. But that's not said in his character motivation. That's the vibe that I get. But it would have been nice to know what he was planning on doing with it. I guess he was just planning on wearing it and assuming that his luck would change because that's what we see in the epilogue. Which also, (laughs) I wasn't sure about that. (laughs) Amity deserves to have lunch. Amity does deserve to have lunch. And I feel like we need to shout out Amity because I did just love her existence and presence in this novel. Actually, favourite character, that weird gnome guy who's living in a weird time travel-esque... What was going on with this dude? I thought we were going to find out, but obviously not. I kind of love that we don't. I felt like he was time looping. Yeah, he must have been, because he said, like, this go around. Instant favourite trope. I'm like, I don't know what you're doing, but I love it. Also, I really loved the random side characters, like Hem and Pendry. They were fun. I really liked them as well. Appreciate Hem being like, I only drink iced coffee, because he's so real for that. He's just gay. (laughs) He's like, I only drink iced coffee and I can't eat gluten, and I'm like... (laughs) I knew that both of us would interpret it like that when he said I can't have bread. I was like, don't make him eat the pastry, please. This is my personal worst nightmare. Make some meringues and then he'll be fine. Some macaroons, almond flour. Macaroons, oh my god. I liked all the side characters a little bit more than the main characters. And I think that was purely because as side characters, it felt okay that they didn't have a lot of depth. I wasn't expecting to get everyone's tragic backstories or anything. But I really wanted more from our two leads. Particularly Viv, I feel like we know almost nothing about her adventuring. And I appreciate that that's not the focus of this but it would have been nice to see a little bit of what as opposed to just be told a little bit of what drove her away from adventuring i need more waking up in a cold sweat due to nightmares yeah that kind of thing maybe just a little bit more hurt comfort that's all i want exactly the care scenes after the fire Mm -hmm. they itched my soul in such a good way that's exactly what i want out of a book the fan fiction vibes were very high 
The issue is you read a coffee shop AU for the character development, just solely for character development, because nothing happens in a coffee shop AU. The point is a background that you can easily engage with without having to think about, you know, how coffee shops work. Exactly. So giving me a coffee shop AU with characters I don't know defeats the purpose of a coffee shop AU. I don't think it's impossible for it to work, but I just don't feel like there was enough of them here. There was slightly more focus on how to build a coffee shop than how to live in a coffee shop. Also, just pacing wise, it felt very odd. Mm. When the fire happened, I was very unclear on if they had been open for six months or two weeks. The sense of time was very strange to me. Like, Rune, the dwarf from Viv's party, shows up and is like, I'm just checking out your establishment, gives her the blink stone. And then she calls him what feels like three days later or something. And then the party will turn up. Where were they? How did they get here so quickly? This is what happens when you don't have a fantasy map. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Yeah, I I agree. The timing was wild. Yeah, I don't even know if it actually was wild. But if it wasn't wild, then I felt no sense of time passing. Apart from towards the very end when he says, oh, it's autumn now. That was kind of the only foothold. I remember even thinking earlier, what season is this? But then it just never came up. I kind of assumed it was summer because it was hot in the shop, but also there was furnaces going. Coffee shops are just like that, Soren. If you work in a coffee shop, you can only ever wear short sleeves because you will drown in your own sweat. And yet we didn't have a scene about how buff Viv looked in her short sleeved shirt. So disappointing. If you're going to do a romance, I need your point of view. Mm -hmm. I've been treated too much, I think. Now I need to know what the opinions are from both sides. I need to know how the miscommunication is going along. Mm -hmm. I need to see the back and forth. The service industry is not fun to work in all the time. I appreciate that it could be your dream to create a coffee shop and also that there will be nice customers and I appreciate that this is a cosy fantasy but it feels weird for the element of conflict here to be the mafia and not mean customers. Mm. Especially when you're creating a new drink that nobody has tasted. This is another thing. The amount that they didn't stock control. (laughs) They're just like, we give some pastries to this person because they're nice. We give some pastries to the Madrigal. We just have a coffee and a pastry. You're not recording the number you cook and therefore the number you have to waste and the number you've sold. You don't have a book or anything like this. (laughs) Because Viv was like, oh, I don't really know if there's any other stuff that we should be doing, but I'm just going to open. I was like, okay, I feel like within a week she's going to be like, I need a f***ing accountant. But that just didn't happen at all. And I was like, wow, has she even got any change in the register? (laughs) There was no bookkeeping. No, it is giving a little bit I have not worked in this industry, which to be fair, he said that it was influenced by his visiting a coffee shop. So he has a romanticised view of coffee shops where nothing ever goes wrong and you never get yelled at. (laughs) I was really just waiting for somebody to hate coffee. Coffee. That kind of broke my immersion, honestly, because I mean, maybe it's just because I hate coffee, but also I feel like it is one of those things that people either really love or really hate. Mm-hmm. That would be a good character moment as well, because I think it would be really disheartening for Viv. And then that would possibly be a good romance moment where Tandri's like, well, not everybody's going to love it, but the people who are going to get it will get it. Mm-hmm. Have you considered putting sugar in it? Or flavoured syrup. I felt like there were X vibes between Galena and Viv. I don't know if I was just reading into it. No, I got that when Viv was like, can you specifically apologise to her? It was given vibes. But that was another timing thing that kind of threw me off because Viv was engaging with them like she hadn't seen them for ages, but also it had only been like three weeks. That felt odd to me. Mm. And I can see that as a conflict of she's already emotionally moved on because she's had this plan for so long. Whereas yeah. from their perspective, she cut and run with basically no forewarning. Also more addressing and guilt of the whole Skullverts have been almost hunted to extinction due to this myth. Oh, I just killed one of a very endangered species for my own gain. No addressing of that. Yeah, I was expecting that to tie back into the plot at some point. That could also be a nice character moment somehow. If Fennis decided that he was going to go after another one and Viv stopped him. If the Skullvert Stone turned out to be an egg and now she has to raise a new one. That would be so good. I'm obsessed with that. That is actually the plot of Ender's Game. But I still would have loved it. The Dragon Prince has it as well. You know, if you want a trope. I did like the thing of it being a found family magnet. And also not even that, just a likewise magnet so that it messed Fennis up. That was kind of funny. But even then, would it really have attracted Amity to him? I love the implication that Amity is actually just evil, a terrible person. <laughs> No mercy in those eyes. Just happens to be the right font of terrible and also has formed an emotional attachment to Viv. The whole sword thing, how did you feel about that? Remind me what the sword thing was. The sword thing being that she has the sword and then she's like, oh, put this holly wreath on the sword. And then she's like, I don't want to use the sword. And then the sword melts in the fire and then the sword ends up on the sign. I thought that was good. It was a nice, very straightforward one-to-one metaphor. 
Yeah, I kind of wanted it to stay melted, to be honest. I wasn't really sure about it being on the sign. Maybe a carving of it on the sign? I think it could have been nice if she had drawn it. And that would have been a nice, like, I can make it part of your new life. I appreciate it in your wholeness kind of gesture. I have to say, in terms of plot stuff, apart from the way they resolved the mafia, which did take me by surprise, the rest of it, it was pretty predictable. Before they even threatened to put the place on fire, I was like, the shop is going to burn down at some point now. The shop is going to burn down, the stone's going to get stolen, you're going to have to rebuild from the ground up, and everybody will come to support. Yeah. You know, it's very classic. It's a very Hallmark movie. Yeah, which isn't the end of the world, I think, but... I'm glad I didn't pay any money for this book. (laughs) I'm a huge fan of everything this book is trying to do. I just don't think it completes its execution. One of the main issues is how hyped up it was, I think, because I went in with higher expectations and therefore it did not meet them. I am wondering if it is just people being so excited to discover that cosy fantasy even exists. Mm. Not to talk about myself for a sec, but having written something quite similar to this before and having done the work of like figuring out how to make something cozy still compelling i was waiting for something to kick it off and nothing really ever kicked right it's like i went through a whole planning process of this is boring how can i spice it up while still making it fun i am your friend so if i have to take this with a pinch of salt but between these two fairly similar concepts i yours is my preference (laughs) (laughs) it's also quite a lot shorter but i still actually feel like the characters are more nuanced which is worrying given that you had a lot less time to work with i mean not worrying it's indicative of your skill but, but concerning for legends and martyrs i think because they had a lot more time to dig into the characters if they wanted to but it just doesn't happen maybe i should novelize t for two maybe you should and release it yeah maybe that's maybe that's my goal. i would read that immediately <laughs> <laughs> we need to just have you do like two straight minutes of barista talk at the end Let's talk about the pressure in coffee machines and how they weren't doing pressure checks and coffee checks every day. They weren't doing brew log every day to check how the espresso was and that it was timing correctly and that they were using the right amount of coffee every time. They'd never talked about like the crema and the look and the smell of the coffee and the taste of the coffee and all the different tasting notes and they weren't measuring out how much came out every single time. Yeah, what do these beans even taste like? Yeah, what kind of beans are they? There are different kind of beans and... Coffee machines are very dangerous equipment if they're not like handled correctly and the pressure is very high and they can just explode. What are you doing to check that they're working? There was no equipment malfunction ever. And the number of times I've had a grinder just stop working and it turns out that there's a single bean just stuck in the mechanism that's stopping it and you have to like pick it up, literally shake it upside down and you're not strong enough to do it, but you're doing it anyway, just over a bin, just shaking a grinder upside down. You don't know why, so you call out maintenance and be like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, have you tried turning it off and on again? And you're like, yeah, I've got a key to the door. Could I have some help? And they're like, we'll send somebody out. And then two days later, they come. And they just turn it off and on again, and suddenly it works. Or did you know that temperature affects coffee and milk and how they steam? It makes everything worse. You have to be like doing brew logs like multiple times a day to check that the temperature hasn't affected the rate of pour of the coffee. And then you have espresso versus just filter coffee. There's lots of different things in coffee. And then milk. Steaming milk is hard to learn how to do you got to like steam it for the right amount of time. And sometimes it's under the waterline. Sometimes it's over the waterline. And you do it for a certain amount. And did they have thermometers? I don't know. Thermometers weren't mentioned. So they were just burning the milk left, right and centre. When you're a good enough barista, which um, not to flex, but I am, you can literally listen to milk and hear how it sounds when it's heating up. And you can hear when it's getting to the right temperatures. You don't even have to look at the thermometer. You don't even have to look because you're listening to it. And you're like, yes, okay, this is at 120 this is at 160 cool i can take it out now you can hear the milk and you can listen to it and figure out and like you know when you've like done too many bubbles and that's cappuccino milk that would be a really nice detail moving from thermometers to being a milk whisperer (laughs) exactly like show me at the beginning when viv is just giving people just bubbles Viv uses the machine perfectly the first time she tries it. You know, I need Tandri to be complaining because the tamper makes her muscles hurt and she like gets a little bit of muscle towards the end and that's really cool. Viv being like, ah, this really hurts my back because I'm standing up all day because she has a bad back. Show me the bubbles at the beginning and everyone being like, this tastes a bit weird. And then by the end, she's doing perfect latte art. She's only have to make swans. She's using like a little spoon to create Christmas trees. I can't do any of those. It's witchcraft. I could rant about coffee for a long time. <laughs> Final thoughts. I enjoyed reading it. I wouldn't read it again. You know, I had like a relaxing time. It was very Hallmark movie. I'm not going to remember these characters. I know I'm not. I think this is a three stars for me. I have little problems with it, but they're not huge problems. So it doesn't merit a lower rating than that. But it also didn't stand out to me. 
Morgan, what are your final thoughts? I'm going to give it a 2.5. Oh. It didn't stand out. It didn't compel me. I wanted to like it, and that's what made it worse. Yeah, that's fair. It didn't do enough to give it a 3. Yeah, I'm just thinking of like other things that I've rated a 2. I would much rather reread this than reread them, but... I'm also not giving half points because I'm scared where that road leads for me personally. Yeah, I'm, I rated it a three on Goodreads, but it is. It's like a 2.5 rounded up to three. Because sometimes I'll do a 2.5 rounded down to two. But this is a 2.5 rounded up to three. It gets a little bit extra. For those who enjoyed it or want something like it, is there anything you'd recommend? Having not read Can't Spell Treason Without Tea, I can't technically wreck it, but I would wreck it anyway, just to support self-published authors and sapphics writing sapphic. Becky Chambers. Oh yeah, Becky Chambers for sure. Squire, the graphic novel by Sarah al and Nadia Shamas. Not particularly cosy, because it is set on a war front, and it is about racism. Slightly fantasy racism, but through a real lens. But it is like set in a fantasy world with very little fantasy. And it's very soft and kind of cute. And it's also really cheap for how big it is. It's like eight ninety nine, and it's like the size of three books. My only recommendation for this is one I've already talked about on the show, but I'm going to talk about it again anyway, just because it felt really similar, which is The Queer Principles of Kit Webb by Cat Sebastian. I recommended it after A Marvelous Light, I think. This isn't fantasy or science fiction, it's just historical fiction. But the vibe is very similar. Kit Webb owns a coffee house. He does so because he quit the, in inverted commas, adventuring life, in this case, the highwayman life. He's dealing with slowing down and also recently acquiring a disability. Kit Webb is Achillean, not Sapphic, but still very fun. I was a lot more invested in the characters and the romance. Also, Mooncakes by Suzanne Walker and Wendy Zoo. I still need to read that. It's very, very good. Very soft. I feel like graphic novels are the right place to go for cozy. When we were in Comic-Con, the same time I got Finding Home Volume 1, I also picked up the first issue of a webcomic called NPCT, which is set in a tea shop and it's high fantasy. And that was really fun. And it had like elementals and a cool like fire minotaur dude who works in the coffee shop. That's by Sarah Millman, and it's apparently also available in physical copies now. Oh my god, because I bought a teeny tiny, like, 20-page issue. Next time, we're continuing with Cozy Fantasy, and we're reading Morgan's Choice. We are reading The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches by Sangu Mandana. And we're really lucky to have a guest joining us, Jen, or at Jen's Bookshelf on TikTok. One of my favourite reads of 2022. Given how much you liked it, I'm feeling very optimistic. I read it as an audiobook, so I'm interested to see how I enjoy it differently, reading it physically. So that will be out on Monday the 15th of May. Until then, you're always welcome through the bookcase. Don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out. Thank you for listening to The Hidden Bookcase, a production of Play Our Prod. On this episode, you heard Morgan Greensmith and Soren Brower discussing Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry, with editing by Kit Lovick. You can find out more about this book at travisbaldry.com, and you can follow Baldry at Travis Baldry on Twitter. You can find The Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase, and on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next, or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode's read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, or send us a DM on social media. We'd love to hear from you. If you're enjoying The Hidden Bookcase, please consider leaving us a rating or review, or you can always tell a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, the 15th of May, we'll be discussing The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches by Sangu Mandana, along with Jen from Jen's Bookshelf. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through the bookcase.